this uh, pre-Thanksgiving weekend, and I am, I am thankful, and I know we have so much to be thankful for because God has been so good to us, good to us as individuals, as families, as a church, so much to be thankful for. We are so highly blessed. Welcome to El Bethel Baptist Church if you're watching from the uh, World Wide Web or through Facebook. We welcome you. We're located at 313 Jones Avenue. We'd love to have you come and join us. And uh, we have a, uh, a worship service today. We're going to worship an almighty, all holy God who knows and loves each one of us. David, let's worship the Lord this morning. Well, good morning, everyone. We're so glad that you're here with us. If you are able and wish to stand, uh, we have to invite you to stand with us. And let's lift up our voices to our Father.
lost yesterday. Um, that was a fantastic evening, even though Baylor did not win. It was a great game. Almost. Yeah, very close. Um, so with us, we have one of our other Beacon sermons, and if you'll bring our uh, announcements, so if you'll go ahead and sit down. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Our announcements for this morning, remember the small group Bible study, we had the opportunity every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock to meet. We, we encourage you if you're not already attending. But I'll continue in every Sunday at 12 noon and our Mondays at 5.30 on WGGS Channel 16 for Pastor Manny Presents. Operation Christmas Child is going on this month and there's a nine dollar donation for the postage. The more we're giving it to the building fund in memory of Mrs. Jean Nelson by Jensen Pat said Darlene Paul Stop. Thanksgiving meal is today at 5 30. We invite everybody to attend. But Christmas Point says there's still time if you can do it today, see Donnie if you want one to buy it. one said it to be put in the sanctuary. Youth Christmas party will be here at the church on December 11th from 4.30 to 7.30. Praise Court had no practice today. Our practice today is at 3 p.m. Uh, next prayer. Thank you, Lord, for gathering us together. Guide and direct us each and every day. Lord, we ask that you put your hand on many in Magali as they come back and that they may be back safely. God is in breakfast each and every day in your work. We ask you in that. Uh, we're going to do off the court. Oh, okay. And after uh, our next hymn, we're going to have Dr. Fats turn to bring a message. And, uh, you can go ahead and uh, As we've done uh, every week, especially since COVID, um, as you're aware, we do not pass plates for the offering, but we do ask you to, um, if you have not given, and we'd be glad to give today. A lot of people give online, but if you are giving today, um, Reed, if you go ahead and play off the for us, please um, go place your offerings in the past.
morning. Now, Bethel, how's everybody this morning? Good. Y'all are awake. This is good. The coffee's set in. Uh, I know that uh, Mark is awake after last night's uh, somehow unexpected victory that the Gamecocks pulled out. I guess the the clock is right twice a day. Blind squirrels find the nut every once in a while. Uh, so, yeah, it's good to be with you this morning. If you've got your Bible, go ahead and find Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28. We'll be looking at three verses at the end of Matthew 28 this morning, verses 18, 19, and 20. If you have a hard time finding Matthew, you can go to the back of your Bible in Revelation and turn left about 40 or 50 years, or you go to the middle in the Psalms and turn right about a thousand years, and you'll eventually find uh, Matthew there at the beginning of the New Testament. While you're finding Matthew 28, let me tell you that it is good to be with you this morning. As was mentioned earlier, my name is Travis Kearns, and I serve as the Associational Mission Strategist for the Three Rivers Baptist Association. Now, that's a big title that really doesn't mean much of anything. Uh, Associational Mission Strategist is the, the old title is Director of Missions. The title before that is Associational Missionary. Usually, I just tell churches, if you say, hey, you, then I'll answer uh, to just about anything. We spend a lot of our time, in fact, most of our time, working with pastors in the area. The Three Rivers Association is made up of 91 churches. So you have 90 sister churches across the northern half of Greenville County and the western side of Spartanburg County. We partner together for two main reasons. And those two reasons we partner together are for missions and for education. And we spend a lot of our time working with pastors in the area, probably 60 to 75% of our time, making sure that those pastors know that they have a friend. Ministry can be very lonely. In fact, maybe one of the loneliest professions uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the known world. Uh, now, that may sound a little strange for me to say that because pastors have all these people around them on a regular basis. But even though pastors have a lot of people around them, what they don't have is they don't have people in churches they can really talk to about issues they're facing. Because let's just be honest, most times issues that pastors are facing are the people in the church that they need to go and talk to. So it can be very, very difficult for pastors to have friends. So we spend a lot of our time just befriending pastors, loving on them, making sure that they know they're not alone. We also provide training and evangelism uh, for pastors and for churches. We provide training and discipleship. We put together missions opportunities and evangelism opportunities. In fact, I've spent some time here. I think I've spent, I saw my wife and son on our way in this morning. I think I've spent more time here than any other church in the association. We spent, as you all know, you had a Next Steps Forward team uh, that met over the last few months. We, uh, myself and a representative from the South Carolina Baptist Convention, spent a lot of time with that team, uh, getting some things kind of put in place and setting some ideas for you guys to move forward. And then did a couple of Wednesday night evangelism trainings here. I probably spent eight or 10 hours, maybe 12, depending on how much Mark wanted to talk during those uh, training times. Uh, but it's been good uh, to be with you. So I've been here now since January. I, I grew up in this area. I grew up in Taylor's, just down the street. I grew up at First Baptist Taylor's and then went to Riverside High School. So if there's any Greer people here, I'm sorry. I'll use small words. I'll talk Greer. So. In fact, I'll for Greer High School people, I'll use smaller words and talk slower than I do for Gamecocks because they have <laughs> those words. That's just the Riverside of me, sorry. Yeah. Uh, and the Clemson. So anyway, I went to Riverside High School and then graduated there and went to North Greenville University. So I can say thank you immediately to your church because every dollar that you put in the offering plate, part of that goes to the South Carolina Baptist Convention and part of that money then goes on to North Greenville University. I'll pay for my education. I'll pay for Jonathan Rince's education, one of my uh, closest friends in college. In fact, probably the closest friend I had in North Greenville. I was surprised he walked up to me this morning and, and it's here. Y'all have a blessing in him. And, as you get to know him more and see him serve more, you'll know that uh, to be the case. So you help pay for my education there and then served for two years at Mountain Creek Baptist Church as associate pastor. And then we moved in 2001 to move to Louisville, Kentucky, which we thought would be a very southern city. And we found out very, very quickly it is the northernmost southern city and the southernmost northern city. Louisville is a place that it doesn't know where it is. It doesn't know what it is. It's a very strange place, but we spent... 12 years there, I did a master's degree and uh, PhD at Southern Seminary and taught there for almost 10 years. So again, your church had a part in my education in giving to the cooperative program of the Southern Baptist Convention. So I want to say thank you for my undergraduate, thank you for my master's degree, thank you for my PhD, and thank you as well because you paid me as I taught on the faculty there at Southern for almost 10 years. And we felt called the mission field, moved in 2013 to Salt Lake City, Utah. My doctoral degree is actually in Mormonism, so... Believe it or not, I'm the only Southern Baptist currently living 
uh, that has doctoral training in Mormonism. So started doing that when we were at North Greenville together, when John and I were there, and Stacy went there as well. And now our son is there. So I can say thank you for my wife, for me, for Jonathan, and for our son who's training in North Greenville. Started studying Mormonism there and fell in love with it. And that's all I've done since January of 1996. When we moved to Salt Lake City in 2013 to be missionaries with the North American Mission Board and help plant churches, and by God's grace and for his glory, we saw 56 churches started in cities that had never had a Christian church ever in their history. Now think about that for a second. Think about what it would be like to live in a place, like for example, the city of Greer now has about 60,000 residents, according to the mayor. I was just in a meeting with him a few months ago. He said Greer's got about 60,000 residents. We lived in a city in Utah of 55,000 that had never had a Christian church until 2013. Never. God called a missionary to that area and he planted a church there and now there are three evangelical, Jesus-loving, Bible-preaching churches in the town of Harriman, Utah, which is in the southwest corner of the Salt Lake Valley. And that place had never seen a Christian church from its founding in the 1870s until 2013. And your church, El Bethel Baptist, right here in Greer, right off of 14, had a part in that. And that's about as exciting as it gets, right? So then we moved in 2019, so we had six years in Salt Lake, moved to, uh, to be missionaries in a foreign country, we moved to Fort Worth, Texas. Some of y'all will get that, some of you won't. Texas is a place all into itself. It's a very different place. Texans love Texas more than any person I've ever met from any state in the U.S. except for South Carolinians. We have a reason to love South Carolina because it's pretty, right? We've got mountains. We've got the belly button of the state in Columbia. But then we've got, you know, the coastal region, uh, in Charleston, all up and down the, up the coast there. And it's just gorgeous. Texas is four things. It is brown, it is hot, it is flat, and it's ugly. <laughs> That's all there is to it. And they don't even know what barbecue is. Texans think that barbecue is made from cow. I could not convince them in our two and a half years there that barbecue is actually made from pigs. And the cow should be reserved for hamburgers and steaks. They wouldn't listen. I think the sun has fried their brains. <laughs> but it is what it is. We were there for two and a half years. I was a professor at Southwestern Seminary and enjoyed every minute of it. But then God called us back to the greatest state in the nation, in the Palmetto State, right here in the upstate in January. We're glad to be here working with all the churches here. So I just want to say thank you for all that you do. Every time you put a dollar in the offering plate, part of that comes to the Three Rivers Association, part goes to the state convention, part goes to the National Southern Baptist Convention to help in all three areas of missions and education. So... That's a lot about me, but we're not here to talk about me. We're here to talk about Jesus. There's nothing better that we can ever talk about other than the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's look at Matthew 28. We're going to ask a pretty simple question this morning from this text. And the text is actually based on a series of lectures and then what turned into a book by a well-known Christian thinker named Francis Schaeffer. Francis Schaeffer grew up here in the U.S., actually grew up in the North, uh, and about in his late 20s, early 30s, he and his wife, Edith, felt called to be missionaries to children to go to Switzerland. And their denomination, he grew up Presbyterian, their denomination actually sent them as missionaries to children to Switzerland. When they moved there, they moved into a college community, a community with a university in it. So there were tons of 18 to 22 year olds in that particular area. Well, Francis and Edith found out that those college students had lots of questions. Big questions about life, little questions about how to get through tests and things to pray for and things like that. And what Francis and Edith did is they opened their home on Friday nights, all day Saturday, and then Sundays after church for those students to come over and just to ask questions. And all of those questions that Schaefer kept getting, he realized that there were some common questions going on. And he turned those answers to those questions into a series of lectures that turned into a series of videos. And that eventually turned into a book. And the book is called, How Should We Then Live? And it's basically his answers to big questions from the Bible. Well, this morning, what I want to do is ask that question, how should we then live? Or maybe to make it a little easier to think about and maybe a little bit more contemporary language, just ask the question, what now? What do we do now? And it's based on the idea that Jesus has ascended to the Father. He did so about 2,000 years ago. And now that Jesus has ascended to the Father, and he's no longer walking with us personally, what do we do now? Right? Matthew 28, 
18 through 20 will answer that very simple question for us. One of the things I love as a Baptist is I love tradition. Not tradition for the sake of tradition, but I love some good traditions. Some traditions are bad. In fact, some traditions are just dumb. Some traditions are good. One of those good ones is, is found in the book of Nehemiah. It says when Ezra the scribe stood up to read God's word, the people stood in its honor. So if you're able and willing, stand with me as we read Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Matthew, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, records these words. He says, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word. You're an errant, infallible, sufficient, fully authoritative word. Not just for us, but for all people everywhere. Lord, this morning as we study your word from the book of Matthew, let us not run in front of the cross or lie behind. Keep us this morning at the feet of Jesus. Open our hearts and our minds to what you would have us to learn. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Be seated. Let's start out, just to get some context here, let's go up to Matthew 28, 16. Again, as we try to answer the question, what now? Or again, to quote Schaefer, how should we then live? Look at Matthew 28, 16. Now what's just happened here is the crucifixion of Christ has happened. He's been buried. He was in the grave for three days. And then three days after he had been buried on a Friday, he rose again on a Sunday. Just as a side note, this is why we worship on Sundays and not on Saturdays. One particular Sunday in the spring is not more important than any other Sunday. Just because Hallmark says it's more important, or just because the certain phase of the moon makes Easter come on a certain Sunday in the spring. Every single Sunday has equal importance because of the resurrection of Christ. This is why we gather on Sundays, right? So, the resurrection has happened. Jesus has been appearing for 40 days, and this is towards the end of those 40 days of appearances. And then we see in the book of Acts, the ascension takes place exactly 40 days after the resurrection. So, this is happening again towards the end of the actual earthly ministry of Christ until he ascends. So, this is one of the last things he gets to say to his gathered disciples, his gathered apostles. So, look at verse 16. It says, But the eleven disciples, why eleven? Because Judas has taken his life at this point, so there are eleven original apostles left. The eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. Why did they go to this particular mountain in this particular place? Because Jesus told them to. This is important, it will come up again later. They went because he told them to do it. Notice they didn't question what he said to them. He said, meet me there, and they did Notice they didn't form a committee on the meeting, the, the meeting of Jesus committee or something like that. Or the Galilee committee or the mountain committee or anything of the sort. He told them to do it and they did it. All right now, look at verse 17. This is where it gets interesting. When they saw him, they worshipped him. Why did they worship him? Because they knew who he was. They knew he was the son of God. He was risen from the dead. They worship Him. That's why, again, why we gather on Sunday. That's what we do as believers. We worship the risen Christ. This is not a Lions Club meeting or a Masonic Lodge meeting or anything like that. It's not a social hall. It's not a social club. This is a church. This is an outpost of the kingdom of Christ. In the same way that these original 11 in verse, the first part of verse 17 were worshiping, so we worship alongside of them the same Christ they were worshiping. But now look at the end of verse 17. But some were doubtful. So they had seen Jesus crucified. They buried him. They'd seen him risen from the dead. They'd seen all the miracles he had performed in his public ministry. They ate with him. They spent a lot of time with him. In fact, Jesus spends the majority of his time with one person, with Peter. A little bit less time with two others, James and John, to form the group of three of Peter, James, and John. And a little bit less time with nine additional people, those original twelve apostles. And the minority of his ministry is done in public in either small or large groups. So these eleven men have spent more time with Jesus together than anybody else. 
That's why they did what he said. But notice what else happened. They were doubtful. Elbeth, let me ask you a question this morning. If the original 11 that had seen Jesus and spent time with him and seen him crucified, buried, risen again, seen him do all these miracles, if they were doubtful, how much more then will we be doubtful? They saw him face to face. They were able to put their arms around him and hug him. They were able to shake his hand or just put an arm around him and do a shoulder hug like good Baptists do. They had meals with him. They could hear his voice in their heads. They did what he said. They believed who he was, but yet they were doubtful. Brothers and sisters, I think this is Matthew's way and the Holy Spirit's way of saying, you know what? That's just the human side of us. Even though we know what Jesus has done for those who are believers here this morning, even though you and I know what Jesus has done in our lives personally, we still may doubt. It doesn't excuse it. It didn't excuse these 11 here. But it just says if the original 11 doubted, we probably are going to have doubts too. Maybe you've been in certain times in your life individually or as a family or even corporately as a church and you've doubted what God is doing. The original 11 were in the same boat right here after the resurrection. Isn't it interesting though that they did what he said but they still doubted. They still had questions. Let's go and see after they're doubting look at what Jesus says in verse 18. And Jesus came up and spoke to them. Let's stop there for just a moment. Two things are true here. The first thing that's true is, is that we are not like any other religion on the planet. Every other religion that's ever been devised in the history of human civilization worships a man-made, idolatrous, dead deity. Worships a quote-unquote God that is not alive and does not speak. As you see in Matthew 28, 18, our God is living, and He speaks. Amen. Now, He's not going to speak to you by writing things in the sky. He might do it. But what you're holding in your hand on your phone or what you're holding in your hand in printed form is God speaking directly to you. This is the Word of God given to us in printed form. It gets no better than this. What's also great about this is the same power found in the words, let there be light, and the light flipped on, are also found in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. That same power is found all throughout the text. So one thing is true, and that is our God lives and our God speaks. The second thing that's true is this, is even though these disciples believed who Jesus was and believed what he said, they were still doubtful. At the point of their doubt, the text says, Jesus came and spoke. We might all in this room be believers in Christ. I hope and pray that we are. If you're not, you're going to have time in a moment to place your faith and your trust in Christ. But if you're a believer in Jesus this morning, you might very well believe, or you should very well believe, who he is. He's the risen Son of God in the flesh. He is the second person of the Trinity. He is the Son, eternal, almighty, and all-powerful. But you still might have doubt. And guess what, church? In the midst of your doubt, God speaks. The best thing you can do when you're doubting is not go seek refuge in another human being or seek refuge in a created thing or put your faith and your trust in created things. Why? Because those created things fail us. As you've probably gathered by now, I'm a huge Clemson fan. And there's an amen. But guess what? Clemson fails us. Hopefully not this coming Saturday. <laughs> or I won't hear the end of it from Mark. <laughs> Clemson fails us. You might be a fan of that school in Columbia. I won't. Called USC. Yeah. <laughs> USC is in Southern California. <laughs> Carolina's in Chapman Hill. I'll just quote my coach. You might be a fan of that school down there. Guess what? They'll fail you too. I'm also a devoted Ford man. Mark and I have a discussion about this as well. When he drives a Chevrolet, I tell him I'm glad to tow it back home for him. <laughs> Don't know they're putting 
heated bumpers on Chevy and Dodge trucks now, so in the winter when they break down, your hands don't get cold when you push them. <laughs> Y'all are welcome to use that anytime. And I've heard all the sayings about Ford, right? Fixer repair daily, backwards is driver returns on foot. But as we just saw from Joe Logano a few months ago, or a few weeks ago, it also stands for first on race day. <laughs> That's the NASCAR championship for those who are not rednecks in the room. But guess what? Fords fail us. Cars, the things fail us. Jerry Reed's one of my favorite country music singers, and he says in a song called Lord Mr. Ford, when you go to buy a new vehicle, you're buying a, quote, ready-made pile of grief. Because you're going to have to fix it. It's going to break down. Created things fail us. The only thing that can't fail us is an uncreated, perfect thing. And that only uncreated, perfect thing in all of creation that we've ever known of is the Lord God himself, the Son himself, and the Spirit himself. It's the Holy Trinity. So Jesus speaks in our doubts. When we turn to things where we can place our faith and trust, if we do so in created things, we will continue to have doubts and failures. When we turn to God's inerrant, infallible, inspired, sufficient, authoritative word, it will never fail you. Because that's when Jesus speaks to us, is always in our doubts. Look at what he says. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, I told you I was a seminary professor for a number of years. One of the things, John, I can tell you this, we did this some in college together. One of the things that religion, uh, religious academics like to do is we like to argue about things. And one thing that's true among all religious academics is that we're all nerds. We freely admit that. We like to study languages that have not been spoken in thousands of years. Because that can bring meaning to our lives. We like to argue about specific theological points and historical points in church history and all of these things. We like to argue about the meanings of words. I can remember being in college and uh, as a religion major at North Greenville, you'd walk into the cafeteria. You could always tell the freshmen and sophomores from the juniors and seniors because the freshmen and sophomores would be sitting at tables just with open Bibles, having had a few religion classes under their belts, they got open Bibles, and they're like screaming at each other back and forth over open Bibles and over open theology books and that kind of thing. All the while, the juniors and seniors had realized this is one of us that's eat, and they're just enjoying watching the show of the freshmen and sophomores screaming at each other. But in verse 18, when Jesus says all authority, one of those words that we cannot debate the meaning of is the word all. All means what? All. all. This is not a trick question. When Jesus says all authority has been given to him, how much authority has been given to him? All. all. Why? Because he is the second person of the Trinity. Because he died, was buried, and rose again and ascended just a few days after this to the Father's right hand to mediate on our behalf. He has all authority. Notice where at the end of verse 18. In heaven and on earth. When Jesus says he has all authority in heaven, that means that he sets the markers for who gets in and who doesn't. Now that's not very politically correct to say that, is it? That some people will die and go to heaven and others will die and go to hell. It's not a fun thing to think about. It's not a fun thing to talk about. It's not politically correct at all. However, when Jesus talked about the afterlife, he talked about hell 75% of the time and heaven 25% of the time. If you believe Jesus on heaven, you have to believe him on hell or he's a liar. So when he says all authority has been given to him in heaven, that means he tells us who gets to go to heaven with him and who does not. What does he say about this in John 14, 6? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no woman comes to the Father except through me, Jesus says. Peter, preaching in the book of Acts, in Acts 4, 12, the, one of the greatest sermons ever preached in the early church, says that there's been no other name given under heaven by which men must be saved. This is very simple. Paul says there's one mediator between God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus sets the markers. It is only by placing faith and trust in Him that we may go to heaven, in Him and in Him alone. And when He says all authority on the earth, that means that because He is the risen Savior, the Son of God, the agent of creation, He gets to tell us what to do and we must do it, just like verse 16 talks about. When he says, go to this mountain in this place, and they went. So he tells us who gets into heaven and who doesn't. 
And while we're here, he tells us what we are to do. Verse 19 tells us what he wants us to do. This is where we answer our question, now what? The first word in verse 19 of New American Standard, you can see on the screen, is go. The second word is therefore. And we can also translate this, therefore, go. Now the word therefore, when you see it in the text, is an indication that you should look at the words that are coming based on the words that you've already read. It's a connection word for previous context. So when he says, therefore, he's saying, because I have all authority in heaven, and because I have all authority on the earth, because of that, go. So the first thing Jesus tells us when we ask the question, now what? What do we do now that he's risen and no longer with us in person? The first answer is we share the gospel message of Christ with every person with whom we make contact. Period. We are to be personal evangelists. We are to share the message of Christ. I know this cross is up here for a reason. I love walking in this morning. I, I remember the uh, first Wednesday night I was here and uh, Brother Benny had put this up here. There were no little pieces of white paper on it. And I love seeing it now, seeing all of these names that are up here that are being prayed for. I want you to think about, if you put one of these up here, think about that person in your head right now. Think about that person's face. And ask the Lord, even right now, to give you opportunity, to give you conviction and boldness and compassion to share the message of the living Christ with the person whose name is up here. Think about the one who shared Christ with you. Aren't you thankful that that person had the boldness and conviction to share Christ with you? Because had that, not, had that person not shared with you, you may have never heard the gospel. Will you be that one for somebody else? Will you be that one for the person that you've put on this cross here? I would encourage you to take every single opportunity to be the one who might share the message of the living Christ, the only message on earth that can give a person hope. The only message on earth that can give a person a positive outlook on life. The only message on the earth that can give a person eternity in heaven, and that's the message of Jesus. You know, we talk about things that we love, don't we? It's very easy to talk about football, if you like it. It's easy to talk about any kind of sports or whatever it may be. How many of you by show fans have children or grandchildren? Okay? How many of you, even if nobody asks, right? So I told you we've lived in different parts of the country for 20 years. We just came back in January. One of the things we realized when we got back is South Carolina's weird. Now, here's what I mean by that. What I mean is I could be walking through the grocery store up here on 101 in Ingalls and see somebody on the same aisle I've never met in my entire life. Wouldn't know them from anybody. And they walk up and they just start talking. <laughs> Look, if you do that in Kentucky, somebody thinks you're weird. If you do that in Utah, somebody thinks you're trying to sell something. If you do that in Texas, you're likely to get shot. <laughs> That's how it goes. So we're in the grocery store our first month or so here, and we're walking down the aisle buying our groceries, and somebody just walks up and starts talking. Stacy even leans over, do you know who this is? I have no idea. Having grown up here, I know some people, but I've been gone 20 years, so those people have gotten older, and I've gotten older, and you just don't recognize them anymore. But they just start talking. Now, my guess is if you've got kids or grandkids, and somebody starts talking to you in the grocery store, you're going to share about your kids and grandkids. Why? Because even if your kids or grandkids are the dumbest person on the planet, you think they are an honor roll student at whatever school they're in, and they will be the next rocket scientist for NASA. Because you're proud of them, and rightly so, because they're your children or your grandchildren. You talk about things you love, and you don't even have to find a reason to bring it up. You just talk about it, right? We talk about things that we love, and we do so very freely. We get excited about things we love. Yesterday, there were 85,000 people in Clemson and 85,000 people in Columbia, and they were all screaming like crazy people, like chickens with their heads cut off. I mean, going crazy over something that ultimately doesn't matter. Yet, when it comes to talking about Christ, all of a sudden, our kid or our grandkid or our sports team screaming mouths get zippered shut and padlocked, and we find it awkward to talk to people we don't know. There's something wrong here. There's something that's missing. Dabo Swinney did not die for us. Shane Beamer did not die for us. Your kids, your grandkids did not die for you and rise from the dead to secure a spot for you in heaven. 
If you place faith or trust in him or her, Jesus did that, church. That's what we should be spending our time talking about. Now we can have fun talking about other things, and sometimes you need a just a quick opener to talk to somebody about something, sports or kids or whatever it may be, might be that opener, but man, don't just end there. Talk about Jesus. You can talk about whatever you might like that's man-made for as long as you want to talk about it, and that person will die in his or her sins and spend eternity in hell facing the full, complete, total wrath of God. So Jesus says, go. Share about who I am. So the first thing we're to do is to share the gospel. What's the second thing we do? He says it right here. Make disciples of all the nations. So the first thing when we think about the idea of what's next or now what or how should we then live is to be personal evangelists, to go. The second thing is to teach scripture, to make disciples. Did y'all know that Christianity is easy? And church is easy. But guess what? We make it hard. We make Christianity hard. We make church hard. Why? Because that's what we do. Humans complicate things. We form committees. Now again, I'm a, I'm a lifelong Baptist. I'm Baptist born, Baptist bred. When I die, I'll be a Baptist dead. We have committees for everything. We even have committee on committees. At the national level and at the state level. We do not have one at the associational level and we never will. We have committees on committees. We have nominating committees. We have flower committees. We have bereavement committees. As though we need a committee to help somebody grieve. Right? We have committees literally on everything. We make things difficult. Very difficult. What does Jesus say we're supposed to do individually? Share about him. Teach the Bible. What does he say we're supposed to do as we're gathered together corporately? Share about him. Teach the Bible. Evangelism, discipleship, that's it. So when Jesus says to go and to make disciples, that's what he tells us we should be doing between his ascension and his second coming. That's what we're to do. Share the message of the gospel with an unbeliever, that's evangelism. Share the message of the gospel with a believer, that's discipleship. El Bethel, I want to encourage you as strongly as I know how this morning to do something. And we talk with this uh, with the next step team about this. Guess what? Go through every single thing your church does, and if it's not directly sharing the message of Christ with unbelievers or directly sharing the message of Christ with believers, if it's not a directly evangelistic or discipling, stop doing it. Because Jesus said, "I will bless evangelism. I'll bless discipleship." And guess what? Even while we're sitting here this morning, we're fulfilling Matthew twenty-eight nineteen. Because the gospel is going out in here and across the internet, and discipleship is going on in here and across the internet. Isn't that exciting to know that 2,000 years ago, Jesus said to do this, and we're sitting here this morning, thousands of miles from where he said it, thousands of years into the future from when he said it, and we're actively fulfilling it right now. It gets no better than that. He also says, make disciples of all the nations. Now, y'all don't share this with anybody. This will be our secret. Heaven is not going to look and sound only like us. <coughs> that, I know this is hard to believe. Sitting in South Carolina, there will be people from California in heaven. I know that's crazy. Mind-blowing. There will be, now this one's really, um, there will be politicians in heaven. I'm tempted to make the lawyer joke so and say there'll be lawyers in heaven. Right? But I think politicians kind of cover that. There will be people from Iran and Afghanistan and Malaysia and Saudi Arabia and China and Russia in heaven. My dad was in the Army in the early 1970s. He graduated from high school and won the lottery. Some of y'all know what that means. That means he spent a couple of years in the name Vietnam. There will be people from Vietnam in heaven. He says, make disciples of all nations. Now, guess what? This is also being fulfilled even as we sit here. Why? A couple of years ago, the world of Christianity flip-flopped. Prior to just a few years ago, there were more Christians above the equator than below 
And there were more missionaries above the equator sent to below than from below to above. But a few years ago, the whole world of Christianity turned upside down. And now there are more Christians below the equator than above, and more missionaries sent from below the equator to above than reverse. In other words, there are more Christians in places like South America and Africa than there are in places like the U.S. and Western Europe. And there are more missionaries from South America and Africa than there are from the U.S. and Western Europe. Nations are evangelizing nations. They're making disciples of all nations. Did you know the fastest growing Christian church right now is not found in the U.S.? It is not found in Western Europe. It is not found in South America. It is not found in Africa. It is found in China, where it is illegal, legally not permitted to be a Christian. Like, if you're found out to be an evangelical, Bible-believing, Jesus-loving Christian, you will be either thrown in jail or killed. If you're found on the street sharing the gospel message of Jesus, you will be put in jail. Period. If you're found in your private residence sharing the message of Jesus and the religious police find out, they take your house from you and put everybody in the house in jail. That's where the Christian church is growing the fastest. Because historically, Christianity has grown the fastest where it's being persecuted. We're not persecuted here. And don't tell me that when you pray over your meal when you were in school or when you pray over your meal when you're at work, that somebody's snickering at you as persecution. Go and talk to a Chinese Christian about that. Go and talk to a brother named David, one of my PhD students at Southwestern Seminary. He lives in northern Nigeria, who every time he comes online for a class, he says, if my internet cuts off, pray for me, because he only lives 20 miles from the headquarters of Boko Haram, which is a fundamentalist terrorist Islamic organization, and they invade his town with regularity on a regular basis just to go in and kill the Christians. Don't tell me we're persecuted here. Because people like David know what persecution is. But Christianity is booming in those places. Make disciples of all the nations. Then do what? Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is one of our marks of distinction as Baptists. We baptize people who have placed their faith and trust in Christ and know what that means. We baptize believers. We baptize disciples. And look at verse 20. After we baptize them, teaching them. To observe all that I have commanded you. How much is all? All. We teach them Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. What's your curriculum for discipleship? You're holding it in your hand. That's what you teach. Everything that he commanded. And then look at what he says. And lo, or behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. How long will Jesus be with us? The answer is yes. Until he comes again, Jesus is with us us. How? Because he sent the Spirit to reside in believers. Even as we are sitting here this morning, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ this morning, the Holy Spirit of God dwells in you and has changed you from death to life and now gives you the ability, having changed you from death to life, to worship him, to know him, to seek his will, and to read scripture for what it really is. To see creation for what it really is. To fellowship with other believers. None of us grew up in the same household. None of us grew up maybe even in the same neighborhood. We're all from different places and different times and different generations. But what? God has put us together and bonded us together through something that Augustine called the bond of love. In the 4th century, a Christian in northern Africa said the Holy Spirit is the bond of love. And that's who dwells in us, giving us the ability to know that he is with us always, even until the second coming. Do not fear when you think about the name that you put on this cross. Do not fear when it comes to considering how you will show the gospel with that person. Why? Because the Spirit of God, the same one that hovered over the waters in Genesis 1, lives in you and gives you the power to do it. You just have to open your mouth and trust that he'll give you the words. That's it. So what now? Again, as I mentioned, we talk about things we love. The question is, what do you love? You can say you love Jesus all you want, but do you put your money where your mouth is? Are you actively sharing your faith with somebody when you come into contact with them? You, again, you might be the only one, the only Christian that person ever sees, ever meets. 
will you be the one to share? Will you be the one to open your mouth and share the message of Christ? Now, you might be sitting here this morning or watching online. Maybe you've never heard the message of Jesus. Or maybe you're sitting here this morning. You are a believer in Jesus, but you're not sure how to share the message of Christ. This is so, so simple. Paul says in Romans 1 that the gospel is the power of God for salvation. You don't have to memorize anything. You don't have to worry about making sure you say all these right verses or do all these right things. There was a great uh, evangelism tool in the 1980s called Evangelism Explosion. D. James Kennedy and down in Florida came up with this. You had to memorize hundreds, it seemed like, of verses to be able to share with somebody. Guess what? That's not an absolute necessity. Dr. Matt Queen, a friend of mine who's a professor of Southwestern Seminary, says this, if you know enough of the gospel to be saved, you know enough of the gospel to share. Well, that's powerful, isn't it? If you know enough of the gospel to be saved, you know enough of the gospel to share. So what is the message of the Bible that's very, very simple? Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says this, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means simply that we have done the very thing that God commanded us not to do. You might think, no, I'm a good person. I don't sin. Really? Have you ever been to the movies and when you walk out, somebody in your group says, don't look up at the sun. It's really bright right now. And what is the first thing you do? What? And you go straight for it. Or maybe when you were a kid, your parents said, now don't eat anything, you'll ruin your supper. But I really want a cookie. Don't eat the cookie, you'll ruin your supper. What's the first thing you do when their backs are turned? You go straight for the pantry, straight for the cookie jar, and it's in your mouth. And then they come and say, you eat the cookie? Mm -mm. <laughs> With crumbs coming out, chocolate everywhere. You did what you were told not to do, then you lied about it. This has been going on since Genesis 3. What happens in Genesis 3? God creates male and female to rule over creation. What happens? He says, have anything you want, just don't touch that tree over there. The creation, the serpent goes and tempts Eve and says, oh no, it's okay, don't worry about it. And Eve goes and tempts Adam, and then Adam blames the whole thing on the woman and on God, and the whole creation gets flipped upside down. So now the serpent is ruling over the woman, who's ruling over the man, and blames it all on God. God says, Adam, what did you do? It's that woman's fault that you gave to me. That's what he says. We've been blaming others since Genesis 3. But the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the perfect standard that God sets for us. And that is perfect goodness, perfect holiness. The Bible says a few chapters later in Romans 6, 23, that the wages, the payment for that sin is death. We are like weathermen. We get paid to mess up. It's the only job on the planet you can have, be wrong every day, and do the job. Except for being a human being and being a sinner, right? You get paid to mess up. The payment, the wages of sin is death. Death, physical and spiritual death. But the Bible says you can escape spiritual death through the rest of Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death, but, and there's the best word in the Bible right there. Without but, we never get to Jesus. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So the Bible is very plain and very simple. If you place your faith and your trust in Jesus that he did enough on the cross to cover for your sins, if you just say, yes, Jesus, you did enough to save me, please change me, please save me from spiritual death, he will do so. Romans 5, 8, the chapter earlier says that even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That means very simply, very plainly, that you can't be a bad enough person that Jesus can't change you. Even while we were actively doing the very thing God told us not to do, Christ died for us. How do you apply that? Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you might be saved. No, it says you will be saved. So the question I have for you this morning is very simple. What now? As believers, we're to share our faith. With unbelievers, we're to share the gospel with unbelievers, we're to share the gospel with believers and discipleship. If you're not a believer this morning, then your what now is also simple. Your what now is, will you place your faith and your trust in Christ, and will you do it today? There is no better time than right now. There's no better day than today to place your faith and your trust in Christ. So this morning I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes. Nobody else is looking around. I'm the only one looking. And I want you to consider to yourself, first and foremost, 
Am I a follower of Jesus? Have I placed my faith and my trust in Christ? Let me ask you directly. Have you placed your faith and trust in Christ? I pray that you have. If you haven't, I want to beg and plead with you and urge you to do so right now. Believers in the room, we need praying for somebody here who might not know Jesus. That God would change that person's heart from stone to flesh. Maybe you're watching online and you've never placed your faith and your trust in Jesus. Now is your time. There's no better day than today to place faith and trust in Christ. Online watchers, those people at this church would love to talk to you. Brother Benny, the pastor, would love to talk to you about this. You can send a message on Facebook. You can send an email to the website. They would love to speak to you. The call, they would love to speak to you about nothing more than about Jesus. I would love to do so if you're in the room. If there's one here who has never placed faith and trust in Christ, I would invite you right now to either slip your hand up so I can talk to you later or come up here and just speak to me right now. If you're a believer in Jesus and you're sitting here this morning, maybe you've been a believer for six days or for 60 years, it doesn't matter. Have you been actively sharing your faith? We share about things we love. We talk about things we love. My prayer is that we are actively sharing our faith with unbelievers through evangelism, and we're actively sharing our faith with believers through discipleship. Are you doing so? Maybe you need to do a little business with the Lord and ask Him to convict you to share your faith on a more regular basis or just to begin sharing your faith. Maybe you need to ask Him to convict you to be more, to spend more time in, in, your, uh, in your Bible. In regular reading. This is your time to do so. If you're not a believer, this is your invitation to follow Christ. If you are a believer, this is your invitation to be more convicted and be more serious about who Jesus is and what he's done. Would there be anyone here who would say, Brother Travis, I need prayer because I'm not a believer. If you would say that, slip your hand up. Nobody else is looking around except for me. I'm not going to embarrass you or ask you to come forward or anything like that. Would there be a believer here who might say, pray for me that God might convict me to be more about sharing with others about who Jesus is and about what he's done. You slip your hand up as well. I would love to pray for you. This is something that we can all pray for each other about. The best news is this. God loves you. Jesus died for you. There is no better message we can share with anybody, anywhere, at any time. Would you stand with me as we have our prayer of benediction? Our God, this morning, we are thankful for who you are. We're thankful for what you've done for us in Christ. Lord, today we ask that you would use your words from Matthew 28 to convict us of our sins. First and foremost, we ask that you would use that word to convict unbelievers, change their hearts from stone to flesh, so that they can see you for who you are, for what you've done for us in Christ. Lord, for those of us who are believers, we ask that you would convict us to be about sharing the message of Christ with those around us. Lord, we know within a five-mile radius of this church, there are 100,000 people, 78% of whom do not know who Jesus is. 78,000 people within a five-mile radius of this church, if they were to die today, would die and here. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. Enter now into eternal torment. Enter now into hell. Lord, convict us to share the message of the living Christ. Lord, start with one here at El Bethel Baptist. May that one convince another and convince another and convince another until we see a movement from this place to go out and share the message of Christ with people all around. 
Lord, begin here with the believers here to disciple each other and to encourage one another such that iron sharpens iron. And Lord, we ask today as we depart that you would keep us safe. We ask you to bring us back safe the next time we meet. And we ask that you would give us an opportunity even today to share the message of Christ with one who may have never heard. Give us boldness, give us conviction, and give us compassion. Jesus wept over Jerusalem because of its lostness. Paul wept over Athens because of its lostness. God, may we weep over the 78,000 within a five-mile radius of this place who do not know who Jesus is. And may that compassion move us to conviction to share. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done for us in Christ. And we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. You're dismissed to go into the mission field.